and, and be made a new creature in Christ and to be sanctified. So my prayer is, is that right now, God, would you just let the water of your word wash over us in grace and make us uh, who you want us to be today. Conform us into your image today through your word. May we not leave the same today. Work for your glory. Build your church today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, let's look really. Uh, let's just go ahead and get, get, get kicking here. We've got, um, we've got two disciples. They're walking from Jerusalem. They're headed to Emmaus. It's seven miles away um, from what I read. That looks to be about a maybe a two-hour journey, hour and a half to two-hour journey. Um, uh, I was trying to get some context of that. I guess that's about from here to the VA hospital, maybe, um, somewhere around that, uh, just down in that area. So they're walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And um, they're a little sad. And what we find out is that they have had some wrong expectations of Jesus. They had the right Messiah, but they had some wrong expectations. Look at verses 13 to 17 again. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you were holding with each other as you walk? Listen to these words. And they stood still looking sad. So though they were kept from recognizing uh, Jesus, and we're not going to really get into that. That would be worthy of, of some teaching and stuff. But we're not going to get into that today. But though they were kept from recognizing him, Jesus appears to two disciples walking from Jerusalem, talking about all that had happened in the last few days. Surely they were talking about how he was unjustly arrested and his, uh, his trial and, and his crucifixion, and maybe even about these reports that his body's not in the tomb. But Jesus comes alongside them as they're talking about these things, and he asks what they're talking about. And their sadness, this is key, their sadness very visibly shows. It's almost as like, the Bible says they stood still, looking sad. You can imagine them talking. Jesus comes up, what are you talking about? And they're like, verse 18. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? So if only Cleopas knew at this point who who he was talking to, who had asked him this question. Obviously, Jesus knew better than anyone what had happened these last few days. His knowledge of what happened was deeper than anybody knew. He not only knew firsthand what happened, but he knew why it happened. He knew what was going on when, when that darkness fell uh, for, uh, over the land on, on those, for those three hours. He knew what they didn't know at that time, that God was pouring the wrath for our sin on Jesus. He was experiencing something that was deeper than anyone could even imagine. He knew. Verse 19 to 24, listen. And he said to them, Jesus said to them, what things? He <laughs> He gives Cleopas just a chance to talk. And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. Listen. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. So again, Jesus gives Cleopas a chance to share what was burdening him, and Cleopas does. 
they had believed Jesus was a prophet. And he is. He is the prophet. He's not just a spokesman for God, but he is God himself. He is the prophet Moses spoke about in Deuteronomy 18. 18. Uh, Acts 3.22 talks about that too. You can kind of make note of that and look at those together. That Jesus was the prophet that Moses talked about in Deuteronomy 18. He was mighty in word and deed before God and all the people. Of course he was. He was God and he is God in the flesh. And they believed he was the Messiah, the one to redeem Israel. And he was. Yet their expectations, we'll talk about expectations today. Yet their expectations of what it meant for him to redeem Israel was deficient. Their expectations were incomplete. Their expectations were misguided. They thought, we talk about this a lot, because it's true, they thought that he had come to redeem Israel in a political sense be redeemed from its enemies. They thought that when Messiah comes first, that there would be the promised glorious kingdom that the prophets talked about, that it was going to be established in an earthly sense. If behold says redeeming them by by power from all their national foes rather than redeeming them to God by his blood, end quote. So they had these expectations of Messiah, and they believed Jesus was Messiah, and they believed he was just going to come make everything right, take care of the Romans, reestablish the kingdom, raise Israel to national or you know prominence again. So when he was crucified, Jesus, it crushed them. It crushed their hopes. And not even reports of the empty tomb or the testimony of angels of his resurrection, none of that even helped their sadness. It's interesting, and I don't know really what's going on here, but it's interesting that that Cleopas says, or or whoever's talking there, says, and it's now the third day since these things have happened. That's interesting. Could it be that he's just saying it just happened a few days ago? And or is he is he is he focusing on the third day as if there's something special about the third day? Obviously, we know there's something special about the third day. Jesus had talked about the third day. He said that he was going to be delivered over to, the, uh, to, to his enemies and he was going to be crucified and on the third day, rise. They never understood this. They didn't understand what was going on. But he had said that multiple times. So are they making some reference to something special happening on the third day in their misunderstanding? I don't know. But even this testimony that the, the tomb was empty, it didn't help their hopes. Verses 25 to 27. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. All that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And then listen to this beautiful, beautiful verse. Oh, to be here when this happens. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So, Jesus gently, lovingly rebukes them. They were right to believe that he was the Messiah. They were right to believe that Scripture taught that he will have a glorious kingdom, because it does. But they had not believed all that the prophets had spoken. They didn't believe, they didn't choose to believe or they were ignorant of or they ignored, but they didn't believe that the path to eventual glory, victory, and exaltation for Messiah in his glorious kingdom was a path that involved great humiliation and suffering. And it was there. It's there. In the Old Testament, it's there. Let me give you just two instances. Psalm 118, 22. Jesus, by the way, in Luke chapter 20, refers to this verse about as being about himself psalm 118 22 the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone in that small just 
part of that verse, you see suffering, you see exaltation. The stone that will be the cornerstone. The stone that will be the, the center, the one in whom all things hold together. That one, he will be exalted, but he's going to be rejected. So wasn't it necessary that the Christ will, will suffer these things and then enter, enter into his glory? Wasn't it necessary, according to Psalm 118.22, that he be rejected and then become the cornerstone? One we go to a lot, and we have been recently, um, Isaiah 53, verses 3 through 10. Listen. We go to this a lot when we talk about his suffering, but his resurrection is here too. Verse 3, speaking of Messiah, this was six, 700 years before Jesus came. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. Listen, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. This is suffering talk. Verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. More suffering talk. Verse 7. He was oppressed. And he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. Suffering talk. And like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave. This Messiah is going to have a grave. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, here's the resurrection, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. These are the scriptures that Cleopas and his buddy had. This Messiah was going to suffer. He was going to raise. He was going to go into his glory. He was going to be glorified. But it was a path. The path to that was going to be one of suffering. And in Luke chapter 22, Jesus actually uses Isaiah 53.10 in reference to himself, numbered with the transgressors. Jesus all but says about these two passages of Scripture, Isaiah 53, Psalm 118, this is about me. You'd think they'd get a clue. If that's about you, then what that says about you is going to happen, and there's going to be suffering, there's going to be glory, there's going to be suffering, there's going to be glory, but that wasn't their expectations. Their expectations were just glory. Warren Wearsby says that was the problem with most of the Jews in that day. They saw Messiah as a conquering redeemer, but they did not see him as a suffering servant. End quote. And that is what was causing Cleopas and his buddy sadness. It may have been his wife. We're not sure who it was. But they were sad because they had wrong expectations. They expected a crown without a cross. They expected glory without suffering. They expected exaltation without humiliation. And so when all they got was a crucified, suffering, and humiliated Messiah, their wrong expectations were crushed, and they were dismayed, sad, and hopeless. If only they had believed all that the prophets had spoken, including Messiah's suffering, they would have expected Messiah to suffer. They would have still been convinced that Jesus, who they thought to be Messiah already, was indeed Messiah because of his suffering. A Messiah, if, if they believed the, that the prop, what the prophet said about his suffering, then a Messiah with no suffering would not have been affirmed as the real prophesied Messiah. But they only focused on his glory. 
They developed wrong expectations and they were let down when it didn't come to pass. And check this out. Their wrong expectations were so entrenched in them that nothing seemed to encourage them. Not the Scriptures that they had, Not Jesus teaching about these scriptures and saying, I'm going to die and raise. It didn't click. Their expectations were so entrenched that they didn't get it. This third day understanding, if they were really thinking something was going to happen on the third day, and then all of a sudden these women come back saying that the tomb is empty and angels have said that he's risen, and that that didn't convince them, their, their wrong expectations were so entrenched in who they were, probably what they were taught from when they were a kid and generations before that, that none of this stuff encouraged them or made them go, hmm, maybe we got this all wrong. Listen, friends, a true, this is so key, this is, this is, a, this is one, of the, one of the grab-on points of, of the message today. A true understanding of Scripture that leads to true expectations of God are so, so important. You know this as well as I do. Once wrong expectations of God based on wrong understandings of Scripture get entrenched in our worldview, it's hard to let them go. It's hard to align them to the truth and hard to develop right expectations of God. Once we get a view of Scripture and God, it's hard to let that view go if it's wrong. It becomes a part of who we are. It's like, it's like roots. You know, like, um, you know, maybe you're trying to pull up a tree or pull up a bush or or, or, and and that root system is just so it's just so in there. And you try to pull it out, pull it out, pull it. You can't pull it out because it's so dug down deep. You got to get something really, really big, really strong to pull that out. What we believe about God. It's deep into who we are. And we err very greatly when we expect different than what the Word of God teaches. The sad thing is this, is some of the things that get so entrenched in our lives, our beliefs about God's Word and our expectations of Him are wrong. They're wrong. John MacArthur says, a deficient knowledge of Scripture is insufficient and dangerous. End quote. When you have an insufficient understanding of Scripture that leads to wrong expectations of God, you set yourself up for disappointment, just like Cleopas. Or worse. Because God will not act according to our expectations. God will act according to who He is and what He has said in His Word. That's the danger of prosperity theology. It's just a a great example of this. Scripture does not teach that God wants on this earth to to wipe you free and clear of healing. I mean, of of sickness. That his, His will is every time to heal you. God's Word does not say that. But there are preachers on TV, in this community, in this nation, and sadly, all over this world that are preaching that God's will is for you to not be sick. God's will is for you to have money. That came from, I mean, that, that is so American in its mindset. God's will is for you to be comfortable. God's will is for you not to suffer. And if you are suffering and are, not, and are sick and don't have a lot of money, then you don't have a lot of, enough faith. You're not trusting God enough. You're not believing His Word enough because that's His will for you. People have made multi-million dollar empires on this false truth, preying on people. Scripture never says that. And so what do people do? They hear it. It appeals to the sinful nature in us that wants to be rich, doesn't want to be sick, wants to live a long time, not go through a lot of stuff, and they start to believe it. And they start to develop these wrong expectations of God. And so when that doesn't happen, and it won't because you will get sick and you won't make a lot of money uh, uh, and, and all that kind of stuff, when those expectations don't come to pass, what do they do? I thought God promised me this. And so they get disappointed. Sad, dismayed. 
Now, a lot of us don't fall for that. Some of you may, and it's easy to, because it's, they're getting, I'm not going to go on a tangent here, but they're getting very deceptive in the way they package it and give it now. Be discerning. But, but some of our misunderstandings about Scripture and wrong expectations come from reading the Bible, but then mixing our human logic with it, right? So we read the Bible, and we read the truth of God, but then we, we, we mix our own understanding of it and our own reasoning, and, and then we develop these expectations of God that are not true either. Well, well God is a loving God, right? Yeah, the Bible says that. Well, then why didn't he fix this? Why, I've got a buddy right now, I say a buddy, he was a high school buddy, but he's battling COVID and he's in the hospital and really struggling. It looks like he's going to make it. If I remember correctly, my as my mom was telling me about this, she's friends with his mom and she said that my, my friend's mom was like, why him? Sometimes we, we get the wrong understanding that, that, why me? Why God? It doesn't seem right in my logical mind that you would allow this to happen to me. God, you know, so, so we, and, and, and we, get, we get traditional uh, 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 beliefs and things that grandma and grandpa teach us, mom and dad teach us that are not scripture, but that somehow we weave into Scripture, and we start to develop these wrong understandings of who God is and what His Word says, and we're disappointed in God or discouraged when we don't have to be, when all that plays out to not be the case. Christian, we don't have to be discouraged and dismayed with wrong expectations of God. If we truly understand His Word, He's going to act according to His Word and even in the darkest and hard times in our life, we can be encouraged because our expectations are right. But it's even more dangerous than being disappointed when God didn't come through on our wrong expectations. When we have wrong expectations of God and He doesn't fulfill them, then some begin to malign God, blame God, curse God, leave God. God, lose faith in God, and deny Him. Because He's not the God I expected Him to be. Wanted Him to me, be or believed Him to be. How arrogant is this? God is not obliged to fit our expectations of Him. He's obliged to be who He is. And we are obliged to find out who He is. Try to understand His Word and form right expectations of Him. A right understanding of Scripture that leads to right expectations of God, it's very serious stuff. That's why we've got to get in the Word and study the Word and dive deep in the Word and understand the Word. You don't have to know everything about the Word to be saved, but once you do get saved, you, we need to start digging into the Word so we can develop right expectations and understandings of who God is. The fallout of misunderstandings and wrong expectations, it's huge and destructive especially when we start spreading our insufficient understanding and wrong expectations to others. And then what do we do? We start setting others up for disappointment and possibly denying Christ as well. Look, I don't, I'm, this is not a political statement, but no matter what side of the aisle you're on, we can all agree that there's a whole lot of untrue news that's going on right now, uh, 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 news that's incomplete or just lies and that gets shared all over social media and talked about and all that kind of stuff. And, and have you ever, I'm not saying that you have, but have you ever shared something or been a part of communicating something that's not true, that has gotten somebody all worked up? And all of a sudden you realize, wait a minute, that wasn't even true. And that, that story I shared on, on social media, that really wasn't true. Or, or that, was, that was incomplete, you know, whatever like that. And we start to share this, this fake news, right? And we become a part of the problem instead of a part of the solution. 
And in the process, we're misguiding people and setting them up for believing wrong information. Folks, the study of Scripture must be paramount in our pursuit. We've got to dig deep into it with a readiness to understand what it teaches, not imposing upon it our preconceived ideas, our traditional thinking, American values, or human logic. We've got to let Scripture form us and not us form Scripture. Look again at verse 27. My goodness, this is, this is a verse that we could preach a few sermons on just this one verse, but I won't even do it in a whole sermon. So here we go. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he, Jesus, interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. This is so good. Jesus explains to these two guys, or maybe Cleopas and his wife, who didn't fully understand scripture, how everything in Scripture pointed to him. Jesus went through Moses and the prophets. That was just the way they said the Old Testament, their Old Testament Scriptures. So Jesus explains to them how everything in Scripture pointed to him. Howell says this, Jesus unlocks text after text from Moses to the prophets that point to himself as the suffering servant and exalted king, end quote. Surely, Jesus' exposition of Scripture to them there on the road as they're walking to Emmaus. Can you see it? Golly. Sometimes it's not just words on a page. It was real. These guys were walking, probably in sandals, on a dusty road with Jesus, walking to their village, and Jesus was having a Bible study with them while they were walking. Probably the most incredible Bible study that's ever been taught. <laughs> Whew, it would have been so good to be there. And surely, as he was doing this, he showed them how his suffering and resurrection fulfilled prophecies of Messiah so they could align their expectations with the truth of the Word of God. Surely, he showed them how the Old Testament pointed to himself. A lengthy quote here from J.C. Ryle. Listen. Christ was the substance of every Old Testament sacrifice ordained in the law of Moses. Christ was the true deliverer and king of whom all the judges and deliverers in Jewish history were types. Christ was the coming prophet greater than Moses whose glorious coming filled the pages of prophets. Christ was the true seed of the woman. That's Genesis 3. Christ was the one who was to bruise the serpent's head, the true seed in whom all nations were to be blessed the true Shiloh to whom the people were to be gathered, the true scapegoat, we'll talk about that in a minute, the true bronze serpent, the true lamb to which every daily offering pointed, the true high priest of whom every descendant of Aaron was a figure, these things or something like them, we need not doubt, were some of the things which our Lord expounded in the way to Emmaus. Folks, I say in quote, all Scripture points to Jesus. Passover, I wonder if he talked to them about the Passover. You know, when the blood of the Lamb spared the Israelite families from losing their firstborn? Now that was a picture of his blood saving us from death. I wonder if he talks about Abraham and Isaac. Now that was a beautiful picture of what he did. You remember when God told Abraham to go sacrifice his son and he went to go do that and before he did it, he stopped them? God did, and that there was a ram in the thicket that they came and sacrificed instead of the son, that that ram became the substitutionary sacrifice for Isaac, and how that pictured what Jesus did for you and I. I wonder, he had to, but I'm, I don't know for sure, but I wonder if he went to Isaiah 53 and quoted to what we just read earlier, and, and quoted to, to them Isaiah 53 and said, that was about me. And that's what I was doing on the cross for you. Man. 
Go read Isaiah 53 and imagine Jesus reading that to you. Saying that's what I did for you. If that were the case, no wonder their hearts burned within them. Leviticus 16 talks about the scapegoat. This is the Day of Atonement. The high priest would read Leviticus 16 because there's a lot more than what I'm going to tell you, but one of the things that would happen on the Day of Atonement is the high priest would come in to the temple and he would bring two goats. One goat would be for a sin offering. He would be sacrificed and slain for the people's sins. But the other goat, watch what would happen. The priest would take his hands and put his hands on the goat's head and he would impute to that goat all the sins of the people. And what would happen to that goat? But he'd let him free to go wander in the wilderness as a picture and foreshadowing of what Christ would do for us. That all of our sin would be imputed to Christ and then what would happen? He would take our sins and remove them far away. Christ is our scapegoat. And so on the Day of Atonement, year after year after year after year, they're doing this. And all they're doing before Christ came is showing a visual picture and a type of Jesus and what He would do for us. All of the Old Testament is about Christ. Because that's what Christ did, right? We're all sinners. We all deserve to be judged and will be judged if our sin is not forgiven. We will spend an eternity in judgment and hell if our sins are forgiven. All of us are sinners and we deserve that. But Jesus came and God imputed to him all of our sin and poured out all of his wrath and all of his judgment for our sin on Christ. And Christ rose victoriously on the third day. The payment had been made. And what had he done for those who trust in him, for those who repent of their sin and believe on Christ? What had Christ done? But had taken our sins and removed them. And they, they, they were gone. Christ was our scapegoat. He took our sin away. Hebrews 9, 26 to 28, or 26 and 28. He has appeared once for all, Jesus. He has appeared once for all at the end of ages, of the ages, to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Verse 28. Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. When Jesus died on that cross, He took care of your sin once and for all. We don't need a high priest anymore. We don't need a scapegoat anymore. We don't need that that goat that was slain. We don't need that anymore. We don't need all that ritual workings that was pointing to Jesus now. Why? Because Jesus is here and He became the once for all sacrifice. And what's He going to do? He's going to come again and He's going to come again not to be sacrificed again for our sin, but to come and save those who have trusted in His already sacrifice for our sin. See, Cleopas and the rest of the Jews that expected Jesus to come, Messiah to come and take care of their enemies, they were a little bit right. Because Jesus did come to take care of our enemy, our greatest enemy. And that wasn't Rome. It was our sin. And He came and He defeated sin and death for us by His death and resurrection. That's good stuff, isn't it? My goodness gracious. All the Scripture is about Jesus. It's not about you. It's not about me. The center of the Scriptures is Jesus and the gracious God who sent Him. Everything points to Jesus. The Bible is a book about a gracious God working redemption for a sinful people for His Glory. Now, the Scriptures include us, but we're just a part of the story of God getting glory for Himself. Pastor Anya Buehle says this, we don't properly read our Bibles until we see how it connects to Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. I'll give you just a quick little one that I've heard before. A lot of people read the story of David and Goliath, and they go, if I can just defeat my giant, You know, have the faith of David. Well, I mean, there's some implication in that. But you know, the real picture in that story is that we're the scared Israelites that are scared of Goliath. 
And Jesus is our mediator that defeats our giants for us. Scripture is about Jesus, not you or me, ultimately. Hendrickson says, in the Old Testament, everything points forward to him, and in the New Testament, everything proceeds from him, end quote. Sometimes we read our Bibles and don't even think about Jesus. We don't think about how, we're re- how what we're reading connects to him. That should not be. But by pointing to Scripture, Jesus affirms Scripture as truth. That's big. Jesus affirmed the truth of the Old Testament Scriptures, and this should be a comfort to us. Jesus wanted to focus them on a right understanding of the Word. And only through a right understanding of Scripture can we understand the most important truths about God, life, salvation, hell, eternity, God's purposes, everything. All the things that matter, only through an understanding of Scripture can we understand it all. Again, MacArthur says, the greatest service that can ever be rendered to anyone is to explain to them the meaning of Scripture. End quote. The church, talking to me, Talking to you, we need to be picky about who we let explain to us the Word of God. It's okay to be picky. It's not just a free-for-all and I'll just chew it up and spit out, you know, whatever I think. Be picky about who you let you teach the Word of God. They need to be those who are devoted to explaining the truth of the Word in all its fullness with no agenda that would corrupt that. And then we need to realize that among all the love that we can show to others, helping them understand the Scripture is among the highest priorities and we should get to doing so. Let's finish this out here. 28 verses 28 to 31. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He, Jesus, acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. That verse 31 is fat, full of wow. But let's just hit it really quickly here. As, as they reached the end of their journey, Jesus waited to be invited before he stayed with them. Isn't that pretty cool? He wasn't like, hey, I'm coming in. He just waited for them to invite him. And they did. And as he sat to eat with them, an interesting thing happened. He, as their guest, performed the duties of the host. Did you check that? They invited Jesus in, but then Jesus is the one that was feeding them. He became the host. The guest became the host. As he broke the bread, blessed and distributed it. When we invite Jesus into our lives, we invite him to be more than a mere guest, right? We give, him the ra- we give the reins to him as the host, the master of the house, the one who's in control. So, have you invited Jesus into your life as your Savior? But for all of us, have you let him take the seat in your life as the host of your life, the master of the house of your life? We know nothing more of Cleopas than than this episode. Some people think John 19 refers to him, but the name might not be the same. The other disciple is not even named. We don't know who he or she was. But the risen Christ made a personal and significant appearance to them, these unknown disciples. Every single disciple of Christ, however unknown, is important to him. You, me, the risen Christ, by his Holy Spirit, wants to come into our lives, take the seat as the host of our lives, and feed us with the teaching of his word. So let's let him do so. Let's not neglect his word. Look at verse 32. And they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures. After they realized it was Jesus, they're like, when he was teaching us, didn't our hearts just burn within us? 
the presence of Jesus opening up the Scriptures to them, giving them understanding of how it all pointed to Him, it made their hearts burn within them. It fired them up, you could say. So how about you? How about me? When by the Spirit's presence and work, we understand the Scriptures? Does that light us up and set a fire in our hearts? Or do we leave our devotion times or uh, sermons or Sunday school teachings or whatever where God reveals to us? Do we just kind of leave it in that room or, or kind of uh, leave it in the car or you know, just kind of leave it and just get lost? Do we leave an understanding of His Word and the depth and the beauty of His Word, the wonderful truth of His Word, do we leave it dispassionate? Do we leave, do we leave it unimpressed, unmoved, or unaffected? I can guarantee you something. If your favorite college football team, pro football team, won the championship, that would light you up. It would light you up for at least a few days. You know something more greater than your college or pro team winning anything? is the daily truth and understanding that the Holy Spirit wants to pour into your life through His Word. Let's not leave unimpressed, unmoved, or unaffected with our hearts not burning within us. Pray that God would cause your heart to burn with excitement and joy and passion as you engage with His Word every day. Last verses here. Verses 33 to 35. And, thank you. and they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they, the two, told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. So notice what happens here. We're just, I'm just flying through this. Notice what happens here. Though it's late in the day, it could have been dangers on the road that might have been why they asked Jesus to stay with them because it was late in the day maybe they wanted to keep learning more from him I don't know but it was late in the day and there was a danger on the road of robbers and animals and things like that but that couldn't stop them seven miles into the day maybe dark they make the journey back to Jerusalem to tell of this wonderful experience to the other disciples. It could not wait. They went that same hour. Nothing would stop them from sharing with the other disciples the news that Jesus was alive and had appeared to them. Nothing would stop them from telling them what had happened on the road, surely telling them how Jesus explained the Scriptures to them and helped them understand and believe them more completely. Nothing was going to stop them from telling their fellow disciples how all of a sudden, when he was breaking the bread, they recognized him. So should our response be to the truth of his resurrection, encountering him, understanding his word. We should be filled with joy that we've got to share it. And I think it's interesting. I think it's so interesting that after this momentous encounter with the risen Christ, who did they want to be with? Their people. They wanted to be with the church. They wanted to be with the fellow disciples of Christ. They desperately wanted to be with them. Those that they had a common bond with. Their common bond was Christ. They were family. All their lives had changed because of Christ. And when their hopes were lifted because of meeting the resurrected Christ, they likely wanted the rest of their faith family to have their hopes lifted as well. I read this, this verse at funerals, but it's so appropriate here. 2 Corinthians 1, 3-4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Jesus appeared to them. It made them joyful. They had to go share it with the other disciples who were also dispassionate and hopeless and sad, they thought. But when they get there, they'd already realized Jesus was arisen because he had appeared to Simon. But I want to say this before we close out. We're, We're a family. We are a family. 
Church, we are a family. We are a family connected together through a mutual faith in the risen Christ and the salvation that each of us have in him. So here's the question. Do we see each other that way? Like, like if that happened to you, if you were Cleopas, where would you want to go? when we have God-glorifying moments, where where do you want to go? Are you just drawn to the people with whom you share the most important thing in life with? Are we each other's people? Are we pointing each other as they did when they got there, the 11 and all the rest, and then Cleopas and and his companion come in, and before they could even say what happened to them on the road, they're saying, the other ones are saying, the Lord has risen, he's appeared to Simon. And then they share with them what happened, and they're, they're just fellowshipping and celebrating the risen Savior together? Are we pointing each other to the risen Savior in whom all of our hope lies? Is the subject of much of our meeting together a celebration of Him, conversation about Him, a mutual sharing of reasons to worship and believe in Him? Church, do we seek to lift each other's hopes in dark times by pointing to the hope we have in the risen Christ? What a drastic difference it would make in our fellowship together if these were the marks of our meeting together in greater ways than they are now. Jesus had risen. He had appeared to them. He had appeared to Peter. He would appear to many more. We're going to talk about that next week. It was real. They saw him. Sadness and doubts and misunderstandings could now melt away. He had really risen. Now, they would begin to understand that his death wasn't the end of their hope, but the beginning of it. Because it's through his death that he defeated sin and sin's wages, which is death. For all who would believe in him, providing for us eternal life with him. And it's through his sacrificial death that our sins can be forgiven by God. And it's because of his very real bodily resurrection that we can know God accepted his death as full for our sin, justifying us, making us right with God. And it's because of his resurrection that we can have victory over sin and assurance of our resurrection from the dead at his future return. And as he told them, he has entered into his glory. He's risen, he's ascended before the Father where he intercedes and advocates for his people before the throne of God. Oh, wow, believer, we have every reason for hope. 1 Peter 1.3 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So believer, devoted to a full understanding of his word, let's find our hope in it and in the risen Savior of whom it speaks. Amen? Amen. God, thank you for your word. It's so, so good. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. God, we often wish we were Cleopas, walking with you, learning from you, but oh my goodness, we've got the presence of the abiding Holy Spirit living in us to show us the truth of the Word of God. Thank you. Thank you that you are with us every day. God, let us dive into your Word. Let us understand your Word. Let us us understand it more completely than we do now. Let us develop right expectations of you. God, help us to get out there and share most wonderful truths that anybody could ever know. Risen Savior Jesus, we praise you. We honor you. We confess that At a lot of times in life, you aren't our greatest joy and learning about you and celebrating you together isn't our greatest focus. God, lead us to repentance. God, may may all we come in contact with just get the sense that 
you're the greatest thing that's ever happened to us. And that we, by your grace to them, might be vessels of communicating a right understanding of who you are and of the, the grace and the mercy and the truth of your great gospel. That they may know you joyful and filled and their life is